Yeah, thanks, Tim, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, just the, the goal today is to, to give you a quick introduction to Patris. Patris has uh, gone through a period of, of reinvigoration um, and looking forward to a, a pretty exciting uh, 12 months as we, as we take our lead asset to the clinic. Next slide, please. And we can take that safe harbour as read. On to the, the investment summary. Patris is a preclinical biotech company. We're developing a range of anti-cancer antibodies. Um, and there are some attributes around these antibodies that are very unique. Firstly, they block the repair of damaged DNA. And when we think about cancer, we're thinking about DNA damage in, in cancer cells. Um, very importantly, our antibodies can cross what's called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, there are no therapeutic antibodies uh, in the world uh, in development for cancer, which can get into the brain. And we've shown that our antibodies can. Um, our antibodies can be, can be used alone or in combination with other therapies, other standards of care like chemo or radiation therapy. Um, when we think about more broadly about the use, our antibodies can be used, uh, can be harnessed to deliver other payloads, um, whether that means delivering imaging agents or drugs um, uh, or gene editing technology into the brain, into the nucleus or directly to tumours. Um, importantly for us, our first antibody we call DX1 um, is ready to go into the clinic where we're planning that first clinical trial uh, in the second half of next year. Uh, and the, the final step, the final preclinical studies are underway, they're, they're toxicology studies. Our second asset, which we call DX3, uh, is, on, is on the road to the clinic as well, but it's a, a few months behind. Um, and most importantly, we target some really substantial uh, unmet clinical needs. Uh, we think of, for instance, triple negative breast cancer, a market size of about 17 billion US. We think about uh, glioblastoma, one and a half billion US. Uh, we think about pancreatic cancer, about three and a half billion US. So targeting markets that there are no effective therapies for. Next slide, please. Quick snapshot of the company. Uh, we, uh, our market cap's about $40 million. Uh, the board uh, is split between Australia and North America. Uh, so our new chairman, uh, Charmaine Gittleson, and I are here in Australia. Uh, and in North America, we've got Pam, Susie, and Mike. And we'll, we'll talk about some, some details of those folks there. Um, biotech has had a pretty rough 12 months and, and we are um, very representative of, of uh, the rest of the Australian biotech industry in that our share price is down about 50%, uh, a bit less than 50% over a 12 month period. Um, very consistent trend across the industry. Um, but we think uh, what we've got coming over the next 12 months should certainly see uh, a return and, and more in the share price. Next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty old fashioned when it comes to success in biotech. I've been doing it for a long time. And, and what I know is that biotech companies are successful when you've got an alignment of human capital, intellectual capital, so, so the technology and financial capital. Um, and the human capital uh, can't be underrated. So our new chair, Charmaine Gittleson, uh, joined the board uh, just a couple of weeks ago. She's the former chief medical officer of, of CSL. Um, global expertise in drug development, um, clinical development, um, very, very strategic mind, and, and we are incredibly fortunate to have been uh, able to attract Charmaine to the board. Uh, me, I've been in biotech for, for 20 years. I'm previously the CFO and the Chief Operating Officer of a company called Chemgenics, uh, which was bought in 2011 for uh, three, $240 million. Uh, also a, a startup out of, out of California called Evolve Biosystems. I'm on the board of, of Oz Biotech, Australia's peak biotech uh, uh, industry organisation. Also on the board of another listed company, Prescient Therapeutics. As I say, I've been in biotech for 20 years. Uh, I, I've been involved with three drugs that are on the market. I know how to get things approved by the FDA uh, and I've done transactions worth, I don't know, more than, more than 400 million bucks. Um, in North America, we've got Pam Klein, uh, who is the former vice president of development at Genentech. Um, uh, and for instance, on the board of a, a European antibody company called Argenix, Argenix has a market cap of about $33 billion. And, and what I'd say to folks is um, Pam would only be involved in companies that she believed in. Um, and I think fairly universally, you've got a, a board here um, that is passionate about the technology and our potential to make a substantive difference to patients for whom there are, there are no good therapies. Um, finally, Susie uh, and Mike. Uh, Susie uh, had spent her, her formative years at Genentech in business development, frankly has done more deals off her own bat than the entirety of the Australian biotech industry over the last 10 years. Uh, and Mike Stork 
uh, is, is uh, based in Canada, um, really strong background in investing in early stage companies, very, very strategic mind. So you've got there, I think, a board that uh, should give people confidence that we really can deliver on what we're going to say, what we're saying we're doing. Next slide, and we can skip straight through to the next one. Um, I'm not going to go all geeky and scientists and talk about the merits of the technology. I'm happy to follow up with folks after, after this meeting. Um, in broad terms, what do we see with our deoxymab antibodies? As I say, these are unique. The attributes, our antibodies seek cancer independently of surface markers. That means they're attracted to all sorts of cancers. Our antibodies are cell penetrating. They get into cancer cells, they get into the nucleus, and they stop those cancer cells from replicating or from the, the DNA from being repaired. As I said, our antibodies can cross the blood brain barrier. And most importantly, they are safe and have no effect at all on normal healthy cells. Um, we've seen results in a range of different cancers from triple negative breast cancer to colon cancer to pancreatic cancer through to cancers of the brain. And in previous uh, clinical studies of, of similar antibodies, there have been no tox issues. So we're really confident that we'll see no tox issues as we move forward to, to the clinic next year. Next slide, please. Um, what can we do with our antibodies? As I've said, we see single agent activity. That means the antibody by itself has been shown to reduce the tumor size and increase the survival in a range of different cancers, um, particularly cancers of the brain. Um, as I said, we can combine our antibodies with standard of care, particularly radiation therapy, um, or we can use our antibodies for uh, as delivery mechanisms uh, to, to target the delivery of different payloads uh, to a range of different cells. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is a very big slide, but we're not going to talk about all the stuff on the on the left hand side. I just want to give people a, a feeling for why we get so excited by by what we see with our antibody. This is data from DX1. If we look at the top right hand side, we're looking here at, at mice which have been given uh, a cell a, a cell line, a, a breast cancer cell line, which preferentially metastasizes to the brain. And I'm sure there are many folks who are watching who have known people who are, who've, who've had brain cancer um, and then who sadly die of, of the metastases associated with brain, brain cancer, particularly triple negative breast cancer, uh, where the metastasis rate is, is about 50% of those patients. And the, the prognosis for those patients is um, very poor, of, of the order of 12 to 15 months. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side there is an untreated animal. The, the red means there is metastasis there. You can see cancer throughout the brain. When you look at the right-hand side, you see animals that have been treated with DX1, and you can see 93% less metastasis, and this translated to a survival benefit of, of about 45%. Uh, so, so that's metastatic brain disease. We think of, if we think of another sort of cancer down at the bottom right-hand corner, a glioblastoma is the most common form of primary brain cancer. Uh, terrible prognosis for patients, uh, generally uh, uh, about 15 months from diagnosis to death. Um, and I just want to focus on the, the, the two lines at the, the, the edge of that graph. Um, with the, the first, the red line is standard of care. This is what happens. This is the curve you see with animals that have got glioblastoma um, where they're given standard of care, which is radiation. Um, and, and radiation is standard of care for humans as well. Uh, and we see the same trends. Um, radiation helps, it prolongs life, but generally, uh, eventually, uh, all patients, just like these, these, uh, these mouse, mouse examples, um, end, end up dying. Um, beyond the red line, we see the purple line. That's a combination of standard of care radiation and our asset DX1. What can you see? You can see these mice living longer, and you can see some of them didn't die at all. If we can translate what we see in our preclinical work into the clinic, um, this will be revolutionary for a range of different patients. Next slide, please. Uh, next again. Okay, uh, we're an antibody development company. Um, generally in Australia, people get a bit itchy with biotech companies saying you're, you're going to need to finish a phase two study. Now that's because most Australian biotech companies are what we call small molecule companies rather than biologics companies. And that's right for small molecule companies. But for antibodies, the trends are very different. 60% of antibody companies transact before their phase one study, before they get to the clinic. Um, when we think of how many deals there are, how much big pharma wants small molecules compared to biologics, biologics are by far favoured by big pharma because they have better side effect profiles and are generally more potent drugs. And what do we see uh, in terms of transactions? We see that 
uh, biologics generally transact for much, much more than small molecules do. Next slide. And just a recent example here. Um, this is a, a deal that was announced a few weeks ago. Uh, Exalexis, uh, a $5 billion company, and Cybrexa, a private company out of the US, um, did a deal worth uh, nominally 700 million US dollars. Um, what's interesting is that there are a whole heap of words uh, around this asset from Cybrexa that resonate with us and with our technology. It's a first in class. We are a first in class. Um, it, is, it has a novel tumor targeting mechanism, just like our deoximabs have. Um, and it targets the tumor microenvironment, just like our deoximabs do, um, and stops the, the, the replication of tumor cells, again, just like our deoximabs do. Now, I'm not promising that we'll bed down a, a $702 million deal uh, in, in the next few months. But what I am saying is that there is a strong demand uh, for assets like this. Next slide. Next slide again. Okay, where are we going? What are we going to see over the next few months? As I said, our lead asset, DX1, is going to start its clinical trial in the second half of 2023. We have systematically de-risked this asset. We can show that we can produce it at commercial scale. Uh, it's going into its toxicology studies, and we're really confident about that. Um, a whole heap of investigator interest uh, for the, the studies beyond phase one, the phase two studies around triple negative breast cancer and brain cancer. Next slide. Our DX3 asset, I haven't spoken about as much. Um, what's important there is that uh, it, is, it is on a path of its own. There's a whole heap of, of potential there to use that for delivery, uh, aside from its, its clinical potential by itself. Um, and worth noting that this, this asset is actually under, under progression with a range of international partners um, to look at the delivery of particular uh, payloads into, into different parts of the cell. And final slide. So why Patras and why now? We've got a, a first-in-class uh, collection of antibodies. These have novel targets and a novel mechanism and have shown to be effective in a range of different cancers, particularly cancers for which there are no effective therapies at the moment. Um, we, our first asset, DX1, is on track to start to, for its uh, clinical trial in the, the second half of next year. Um, our DX3 platform can be used to deliver a range of different payloads into cells. Um, and we are in a part of the industry where there is a very strong deal flow and we've got a team of people who know how to deliver on teams. So we think it's a really exciting time. The 12 months ahead uh, have us, uh, have us uh, pumped, frankly. Uh, and I think I'll leave it there, Tim. Thanks, thanks, James. Now, um, we've had lots of biotechs and uh, we've got probably an experienced audience in, in this space. Um, and there's always a lot of transactions in biotechs. There's the funding pathway and then there's transactions partnerships, agreements, things like that. What, what, what does a, a transaction look like uh, for Patris moving into 2023 and beyond? What would be the ideal sort of transaction? Well, uh, so I, I think it, it's, it's always a, it's an open question. When, when will you transact? And, and what, I, what I've shown and, and the data supports this for antibodies generally, more often than not, they transact before they get to the clinic. And, and so we, I've said we'll be in the clinic at the, the, in the second half of next year. Um, does that mean we'll transact? Um, the, the, the odds would say yes. Um, I'm not going to say yes. I, I, all I can talk is, is in terms of industry averages. So a transaction is certainly something that is within scope. Um, also important to note that a lot of the work we're doing at the moment, a lot of the preclinical work is work that uh, has been requested by the people who would be the, the acquirers. Um, and we're on the record of saying this, um, there is work that we're doing at the request of, of Big Pharma, um, which gives should give our, 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 our listeners uh, an indication of the scope and the, the level of engagement we've got with the, the people we would like to, to see a transaction with. And you've obviously got a, a very experienced board that can help you with any transaction. What, what um, finishing up, what, what does 2023 look like in terms of your milestones and, and what sort of targets would you like to reach? Well, I, I think there's, there's a, a range of milestones um, in terms of de-risking the asset. And, and that's what we're all about. Um, so so the, the, the most important uh, step in de-risking an antibody is showing that you can, you can produce it at a commercial quantity. We ticked that off last year. The next thing is, is showing that it's safe in toxicology studies. Um, our tox studies will finish in, in Q2 of next year. So in terms of the path to the clinic, um, those would be the two things. Uh, the other thing that, that again, um, we, we are referred to is this other asset, DX3, which has 
potential for uh, delivery of payloads. Now, we're a cancer company, we're not a delivery company. So all of this potential for non-dilutive cash from payload deals um, is, is cream on top. Um, and we, we are certainly working uh, with a range of companies about evaluating that technology at the moment. So there are things which uh, are certainly on our, our critical path, Tim, um, and we'll, we'll tick those off as we move through 2023. Um, there are other things that actually might uh, strike people as a bit of surprises, but we're working pretty hard to, to provide good surprises as well. Thanks, James. There's a couple more questions online. If you've got time just to type in those answers, it'd be appreciated. Otherwise, I'll follow up uh, with you early next week. Thank you for your time. Have a nice weekend. Thanks.